There's no shame in getting a game over from losing a tough battle or failing to complete a puzzle in time. Get good, scrub! Alright, maybe there is a little shame. Meanwhile, there is a lot of shame in getting one of these embarrassing game overs, where we manage to lose the game through stupidity, ineptitude, or on one memorable occasion, pissing off a powerful vampire. Now enjoy our most shameful game overs and beware spoilers ahead for the following games. Mademoiselle, what are you doing? I decided it would be wrong of me to hand over the notebook. I'm going to call the police. My warning is out of respect for Werner's memory. If Lara Croft wasn't one of the mansion-owning elite, there's no way she'd get away with the stuff she does. Robbing antiquities, killing people, killing dinosaurs. Great, there goes the scientific find of the century. Nice archaeology, Lara. By the time we got to Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, however, someone was clearly fed up with Lara's immunity to repercussions, which is why if you do the wrong thing, you can get a game over in which Lara Croft is actually arrested for one of her many, many crimes. This comes not a moment too soon either, as Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness is the game in which the designers decided to make Lara darker and edgier, as evidenced by how she's happy to snap the necks of numerous minimum wage Louvre security guards. Oh. Yeah, that'll teach them to do their job. It's not just murder Lara is into now. Go about things the wrong way and apparently burglary is also on the table. Because when tasked with retrieving the notebook of her mentor Werner von Croy from an old lady's apartment, you're given two options. One, ask her nicely, or two, piss her off and end up having to nick it. I think you'd better leave, Miss Croft. What about the notebook? I think not. Then I was unsure of you, and so am I. You have to be quick about it, however, because hang around too long, and that's when you'll get busted by the gendarme. You have approximately a minute to search the apartment for the notebook, and you'll get two warnings. First, the police cars will roll up outside the building, and second, you'll get a look at the officers stacking up outside the door. Ignore both of those and just mooch around admiring the decor and robbing vintage cognac, and the inevitable happens. Olima! It's fine, they're probably just the fashion police arresting her for wearing double denim. Plus un geste. It's an open and shut case. Remember, do exactly as I say. The cubicle across from you is empty. Go, now. The first Matrix game, Enter the Matrix, starred a sort of Matrix B team who had minor roles in the second and third movies. Why do you do that? Do what? Check your guns. You never know. The later Matrix game, Path of Neo, on the other hand, put you in the trench coat and hot topic goth boots of Neo himself. As the name suggests, Path of Neo follows Neo's path through the movies, which means it includes the iconic scene in which Morpheus offers Neo a choice of two pills. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. Taking the blue pill would leave Neo within the Matrix simulation. Taking the red pill would eject Neo from the Matrix like an unwanted USB stick, so he could be rescued and join the human resistance in the real world. The choice is yours, Neo. What about the third option? Don't accept candy from strange men. No offense, Morpheus. Anyway, clearly, you're supposed to follow the actual path of Neo and accept the red pill in order to later develop the ability to dodge bullets and become mankind's saviour against the dastardly forces of Elrond from Lord of the Rings. In a hurry to meet someone, Mr. Anderson. But if you're dumb and contrary like us, when you're given the choice, you'll choose the blue pill and Morpheus does his whole, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed thing. Perhaps I was wrong about you, Neo. I'm sorry you won't be joining us. Yeah, all right, Dad. Rather than a further six to eight hours of doing Neo's boring office job, this particular path ends with us getting a hard game over and booted right back to the main menu. In our defense, when Morpheus said taking the red pill meant we'd stay in Wonderland, he didn't say that Wonderland would be a barren hellscape populated by horrible squid robots and where everyone looks like they haven't eaten in three weeks. You saved me. Save yourself. Look, I stand by my decision. Which is why I'm subjecting you to the most serious punishment I can think of. 100 
billion trillion years standing here in the serious room. Perhaps after that we can talk about the severity of your actions and whether you've learned anything. But until then, serious room, go! Sometimes we all need a little helping hand with a video game. That's why I'm paying a local urchin to complete Dark Souls for me. Here you go, governor! Hang on, are you still using the Drake Sword? You go back and you do it properly! Honestly, you can't get the staff these days. Even so, you'd think twice before trying to use cheats, especially in a game as meta and fourth wall breaking as the Stanley Parable, the bizarre conceptual office simulator in which an omnipresent narrator spends the whole game making you feel vaguely inferior. But Round Stanley walked upstairs. Stanley to was in such a rush. Stanley is quite a boy. Stanley for the first time. Stanley realized Stanley, Stanley had never seen Stanley the office. Stanley knew the office Stanley, 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 Stanley was Stanley, 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 and you'd be right to think twice, because it turns out that trying to activate server cheats in the Stanley Parable leads to you being sent to the naughty step, or as it's known in the world of the Stanley Parable, the serious room. Stanley, this is me being serious. In fact, this is my serious room. It's where I come to be serious. The name is no joke. This is one serious room. The walls are bare and grey, it's lit by a single fluorescent strip light, and the table, the table is the most serious table that the narrator could find. And believe me, he looked. It's possible I looked at over a thousand tables. I honestly don't know. The specific number isn't as important as the understanding that of all tables I looked at, this one is the most serious. That's serious dedication. Anyway, for having the temerity to try and cheat, you were given a stern lecture about how cheating is wrong and how you could have broken the game. And then you're sentenced to infinity years in the serious room. Infinity years in the serious room. I generally have trouble reading human emotions, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you're devastated by this crippling new punishment. There's no way out of the serious room, so you'll have to start the game all over again because, and it's possible you picked up on this point, the narrator is quite serious about not wanting you to cheat. That's why you got the worst ending. And believe me, I will be laughing at every second of your inevitable life from the moment we fade in until the moment I say, happily ever up. Okay, the second worst ending. The Tachyon Mining Beam is being made ready to destroy human cities. Humanity is on the verge of a new era. I, Shodan, am its new god. In most games, you spend your whole time trying to avoid doing what the baddie wants you to do. That's sort of the point. But in the original System Shock, technically you're trying to achieve exactly what evil supercomputer Shodan is also trying to achieve, which is the activation of a giant mining laser attached to the Citadel space station. The difference is, where Shodan wants to use it to obliterate Earth and end human civilization, you want to raise the station's shields first, causing the laser to malfunction and explode. Either way though, that laser is going off sooner or later. And although academically we are fully on board with the plan to raise the shields and foil Shodan, sometimes the temptation to press a large red button with the words laser control underneath is just too much to resist. I mean, how much damage could it really cause? Thank you. you. You have saved us all some effort by destroying the greater part of Earth's civilization yourself. Oh, hmm. So yes, you destroy Earth, you get a game over where you're booted back to the title screen, and worst of all, receive an extremely smug email from Shodan thanking you for wiping out all of humanity, yourself, and saving her the trouble. Please wait where you are, and a Cortex Reaver will arrive shortly to escort you to the celebration. Okay, but Shodan did mention something about a celebration, and if there's cake, I'm there. All the universe's bakeries are on Earth! What have I done? Nineteen ninety-four first-person shooter Rise of the Triad is a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. After all, this is a game in which one of the characters is called IP Freely, and where everyone wears seasonal hats if you play it on certain days. <laughs> kind of bad for those enemies now. You know, having to work Christmas. Make it to the game's final boss, El Oscuro, however, and you'll discover that it's not all fun and games in this fun game. 
El Oscuro is the wacky leader of a doomsday cult, only in this case, it turns out he might actually have a point, as he's able to fire bolts of magical energy at you and transform into a snake. He also has some kind of deeply weird method of reproducing that involves gross eggs with his face on them, something the game asks you to destroy if you can find the time while you're battling a terrifying snake monster with a human face. I'm just saying, on the priorities list, it's not up there. Still, defeat El Oscuro and you can bask in the satisfaction of a job well done, and enjoy your hard-earned ending right up until the point where the game informs you that actually it's game over because you didn't destroy all of El Oscuro's larvae and one of them grew up to destroy the entire world 30 years later. Bad luck. The credits then roll and an unseen voice tells you that you suck. to the fun, Rise of the Triad. All right, you can forget me wearing my Guinness-themed top hat for St. Patrick's Day. I'll just wear it on Arthur Guinness's birthday, Bloomsday, and the entire Rugby World Cup next year. Let's try the metal. Ask anyone who's tried to hold a conversation with a five-year-old and they'll tell you that someone asking too many questions can get annoying. Why? Because sooner or later you're going to run out of answers. Why? Because there's only so much you can say about certain topics. Why? A five-year-old or Mike. Why? So yes, it's quite an annoying habit, which is why you probably shouldn't do it when you're talking to an ancient, vicious, supernaturally powerful vampire who could easily kill you in the blink of an eye. Bear in mind we're not talking about The Witcher 3's standard vampires here, who are pretty easy to deal with if you don't mind a bit of bad language. Is it 1358 yet? No. Then f off. No, we're talking about the unseen elder vampire from the Blood and Wine expansion, who, despite being possibly thousands of years old, still doesn't like people wasting his time. You were to speak, not question. Speak or die. Cave I came out of? Or was that place? Questions. More questions. Yep, this Nosferatu-looking dude is not messing around. You'll get one warning, after which asking another question unrelated to his interests gets you insta-killed in the most embarrassing way possible for a professional monster hunter. You waste my time. No, no, wait! To be fair, he's a witcher, not a vampire -er. Why? All right, that is it, young man. I'm Callista. I work here for Admiral Havelock. I'm sorry to intrude on your business, but this is important. I suspect you're going to kill the High Overseer, that wretched man. Dishonored's Corvo Atano is a man of honor. Well, as much of a man of honor as someone who always wears a mask, steals anything not nailed down, and delivers unconscious women to their stalkers can be. You'll never know how happy you've made me. Someday she'll learn to appreciate me. After all, she'll have her whole life. So when you're exploring the Hound's Pits pub and come across loyalist tinkerer Piero peeping through the keyhole at Callista Kerno bathing, it's entirely in character for Corvo to give him a stern lecture about not spying on people. I couldn't bear it if she knew. I know you're a man of honor and I also know that you can kill me at any time. And for both of these reasons, I am. What is much less in character is for Corvo to do some peeping himself, before barging into the bathroom, clumsily hitting on Callista, and then attempting to get into the bath himself, fully clothed. Which is why you get an unbelievably embarrassing game over if you try and do exactly that. Yes, according to the Game Over screen, the Loyalist Conspiracy is now dissolved due to irreconcilable hostilities, which is a nice way of saying Corvo was kicked out for being a horrifying sex pest. Presumably Callista also delivered some irreconcilable hostility to his crotch on the way out. He can't have much left in him. I give him three days, tops. If we fail and he dies, we lose our chance of revenge. 
The very first mission in Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain that doesn't involve you staring at Kiefer Sutherland's butt is the mission called Phantom Limbs, in which you have to rescue Kazuhira Miller from an Afghan military base. Put those nine years behind you and return his big boss. That's how Koss would want it. At the start of the mission, Revolver Ocelot gives you, amongst other things, a horse, Kaz's sunglasses, and a long, long speech about your legend, Kaz's predicament, and proper use of binoculars. I expect you'll become quite familiar with those binoculars as you plan your next move. What you'll gather from this chat, apart from the fact that Ocelot is super into binoculars, is that time in this mission is of the essence. Kaz is in a bad way, and there's no time to waste if Venom Snake is to extract him to the safety of Diamond Dogs' mother base. Snake... They do something to your eyes? No, it's... It's just bright as all. Of course, this is a video game, which means that when someone says time is of the essence, you've actually got as much time as you want to run around stealing rough diamonds, smoking phantom cigars, attaching stuff to balloons, and seeing how far you can dolphin dive off of things. Eventually, you'll decide that, all right, fine, I'll go and rescue Kaz, at which point you'd better hope that three in-game days haven't passed, because if they have, things are going to play out a little differently to what you might expect. Haha, <laughs> Kaz! I'm sorry that took a while, but uh, you should have seen this sweet dolphin dive I did. Kaz? Kaz, it's me. I'm here to get you out. Kaz. Yeah, it turns out Ocelot wasn't kidding about time being of the essence, and in the three days you spent mucking about in the Waxin barracks, Kaz died from the fact that he, you know, recently lost several limbs. Boss, the target's dead. We're too late. Mission failed. And you get an embarrassing game over for having let Kaz die, and worst of all, causing a time paradox. Awkward, but uh, hey, at least I know how to use binoculars now, so uh, hey Ocelot, it wasn't a complete waste of time, yeah? Those Aren't binoculars? Are they not? Man, I really wasn't paying attention. Now go! Let the legend come back to life. So those were some of the most embarrassing ways that we've got game overs in games. How embarrassing for us, probably shouldn't have brought them to your attention because now we're embarrassed. But if you want to learn more about video game game overs, we've got a few more videos for you here. There's one up here from Outside Extra, which is about games you'll be a lot happier if you never do the final mission, so never getting a game over. Down here is one from us, which is about game over screens in old arcade games that were absolutely horrifying. So enjoy that.